I suggested that while there's a great variety of creation myths, if you look at the <coughs> creation myths of Mediterranean countries and the general cultural orbit of the Bible, you find certain typical forms emerging. And one of these we described as the sexual creation myth, which simply takes the natural cycle and assumes that the creation was the starting off of this cycle of new life coming to birth. And that, and that while there are many exceptions in mythology, still one very common, natural, and frequent form, figure, for this kind of creation myth to focus on would be an earth mother. <clears throat> and that seems to be, as far as we can see, the general type of creation myth that we find in the uh, East Mediterranean countries in pre-biblical times, at any rate. The one that we find in the first chapter of Genesis is an artificial creation myth where the world is originally made rather than simply coming into being, and where the focus is a sky father rather than an earth mother. And <clears throat> I suggested that one significance in that contrast is that in an earth mother or sexual uh, creation myth, you have simply the cycle of nature and the seasons extended, and that in the Bible there is a, a belief in a historical process, in a sense of the process of time going somewhere and meaning something, which involves a revolt against all cyclical uh, conceptions of reality. A cyclical conception of reality is essentially the deification of a kind of machine. That is, it's, uh, it illustrates the ineradicable tendency of the human mind to, event, to invent something and then abase himself in front of it. That is, no soon has the human mind invented the wheel then it starts inventing projections of a wheel of fate or a wheel of fortune as something ineluctable and mysterious and stronger than man himself. And <clears throat> it seems ironic that these projected images uh, should almost invariably be taken from man's own inventions. Anyway, the the first chapter of Genesis, uh, the later or priestly account of creation, seems to think in terms of a cosmos emerging from chaos and as being associated with an awakening of consciousness which uh, seems to be symbolized in the emphasis on the metaphor of days of a week. <clears throat> The second or Yahweh's account, which begins in the second chapter, uh, is much older, and not all the old sexual uh, mythology has been eliminated from it. That is, the, the second account begins with the watering of a garden, and we've already seen a suggestion in the Song of Songs and elsewhere uh, of the garden as the bride's body. And, uh, and it's in this older account again that Adam is made from the dust of the ground, Adama, which is a pun in Hebrew, but Adama is feminine. And uh, so there's a sense in which Adam had a mother as well as a divine father. What is more important in this contrast for us at the moment is this. A sexual creation myth focused on an earth mother 
has no problem with the conception of death because it is a myth which concerns very largely living things, animals and plants, all of which die. So that in a sexual creation myth, death is built in. It is not only an inevitable part of the myth, it is in some respects the only element that really makes sense of it. But we suggested that the artificial myth <clears throat> thinks more in terms of sky metaphors, of the sun that sets in the evening and comes up again as the same sun the next morning. And uh, the bodies in the sky, this, the sun, the moon, the planets, are not living things in the same way, though they may be deified, as animals and plants are, but they suggest a recurrence of the same thing, and they, re they suggest also a sense of planning and of intelligence, that is, a control of affairs in which the same recurring phenomena are brought back and back. So it's clear from this and from many other considerations as well that in the biblical account of the creation, God could have created only a perfect and model world in which there could be no death or sin or misery or pain. And that is the reason why we are told in that <clears throat> account in the first chapter of Genesis that God made something and then saw that it was good. And as Bernard Shaw says in one of his essays, what would he say now? And uh, <laughs> the answer is, of course, that he would say, according to the traditional Christian interpretation, this is not the world I made, this is the world you fell into, and it's all your fault, and not the least little bit my fault. See Paradise Lost, books 1 to 12. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously we can only get to that interpretation by doing a certain violence to the biblical account. For one thing, it is traditional, and you'll find it in Paradise Lost as well as elsewhere, that everything that we find inconvenient in nature, from mosquitoes to earthquakes, is the result of a fall in nature which accompanied or was part of the original fall of man. But that is, of course, pure reconstruction. There is nothing about a fall of nature in Genesis. It is said that God cursed the ground, but he removed the curse before the flood, so that doesn't count either. The, uh, the essential point is that it is a matter of belief in the biblical religions, Judaism and Christianity, that the original world created by God must have been a model world, and consequently an artificial creation myth must have an alienation myth like that of the fall of man to account for the difference between the world that such a God must have made and the actual world that we're living in now. Of course, this implies that the, that the perfect or model world was made primarily for man's benefit, and that is a belief which has obvious psychological links with paranoia, but as Thomas Pynchon remarks in his very remarkable novel, Gravity's Rainbow, man cannot live except in a paranoid state. He has only the choice between creative and destructive paranoia. So it is not the, the fact that 
that the world was created for man's sake, which is the difficulty, but simply that for an artificial creation myth which assumes an intelligent and planning God, one needs to complete it, the myth of the fall of man. The fall of man is described very obliquely in the book of Genesis. There are two trees, we are told, a tree of life and a tree of knowledge. And again, if you think of the principle of metaphor, they are clearly the same tree. The forbidden tree has a cursed serpent crawling limply away from it on its belly. And as a serpent is very frequently a sexual or a phallic symbol, one would expect that the tree of life in an original version of the story would have had an erect serpent climbing up through its branches as it still does in certain symbolic systems like those of Kundalini Yoga in India. And elsewhere, too, the serpent is the symbol of wisdom so that the knowledge that man gained by the fall through the subtle serpent, the deceiving serpent, must have been in some respects an illusory knowledge. It is also, of course, a uh, A, a, a knowledge which has something to do with the discovery of sex as we know it. Because as soon as the knowledge is acquired, Adam and Eve knew that they were naked and looked around for clothing. So that the original unfallen state is apparently conceived as being a sexual ideal of a kind that we have since lost the key to. The uh, Freudian psychologist Jacques Lacan speaks of the myth of the lost phallus as being one of the most widespread of human, human conceptions. And it certainly seems involved in the, in the uh, Genesis account as well. Now, is it, uh, are there any questions on this, this point that the, that the artificial creation myth goes along with an alienation myth of fall in order to make it fully intelligible? Yes. Well, as I was uh, uh, saying last day, I thought that <clears throat> I think that the reason for the patriarchal emphasis in the Genesis account is only partially and up to a point a rationalizing of a patriarchal society. I think that the the parent is the metaphor for the the whole. Um, aspect of reality which is not oneself but is nevertheless completes oneself and that of the two parents the mother is the parent that we have to break from in order to get born so that the emphasis on the creating activity of a male god has to do with the Bible's revolt against conceptions of an indefinitely turning cycle such as we have in most earth mother mythologies. I'm passing over for the moment, at any rate, the, uh, <clears throat> the flood story, which in a sense completes the uh, account of the, the fall of man. And uh, 
If there are no further questions on the myth of creation, I'd like to go on to the next phase that I want to deal with, the phase uh, known as Exodus or the, the, the revolutionary phase. That begins in the first chapter of Exodus, and there we are told that the Hebrews had entered Egypt under the patronage, not merely of Joseph as the advisor of the Pharaoh, but of the Pharaoh himself. And uh, that is consistent with what we find all through the Bible, that the world ruler is not necessarily thought of as an evil or wicked man in the Bible, but he rules over the kind of world in which sooner or later a successor of his will be evil. That is, the Pharaoh which who welcomed the family of Jacob into Egypt was a benevolent Pharaoh, but in the course of time there was a, a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph and attempted to get rid of the Hebrews by genocide. Uh, the first Persian monarchs, Cyrus and Darius, are spoken of with the greatest respect, but before long we have Ahasuerus and Esther, the Xerxes of, of history, who attempts again another pogrom of, <coughs> uh, of uh, genocidal proportions. At the time of the Roman Empire, Paul insists that the powers of be are ordained of God, but in no time at all we have Nero and the other persecuting Caesars. And although uh, Alexander the Great is represented by Josephus as being welcomed into Jerusalem by the high priest, uh, in course of time the Syrian Seleucian Empire produced Antiochus and that persecution there. So in many respects <clears throat> the account in the Bible might have been simpler if it had begun where the story of Israel in effect begins with God appearing in a burning bush to Moses. Uh, if you start the Bible with that story where Moses in Egypt, having escaped from the original massacre of Hebrews and having been brought up as an Egyptian, uh, looks over the, the, uh, the landscape and sees a bush burning without burning up. And <clears throat> Once again, the emphasis is on the ear rather than the eye. The, <clears throat> the fact that the bush burns without burning up is merely there to attract Moses' attention, and he goes out of his way to see this strange sight. But it is the voice that speaks from within that is important. Now, if you begin a story there, you have immediately wiped out that whole dreary chess game that is known traditionally as theodicy. That is, how are you going to reconcile the existence of a perfectly good God with a horribly bad world, and yet without involving the good God in the bad world in any causal way? It's a, a problem of white not to move and win. And uh, it's, uh, it's a silly problem, I think, and a made up one. And the one that begins the Exodus story is much more intelligible. Here, there is a situation of tyranny and exploitation going on to start with. That is the first datum is injustice, tyranny, and exploitation. And God then announces that he is giving himself a name and a highly partisan role and is going to enter history on the side 
of the oppressed classes. <clears throat> Never mind how you got into this situation, how you get out of it is the important thing. <clears throat> And so, Moses grows up and gathers Israel around him, and there is the story in Exodus about the plagues, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, and then the crossing of the Red Sea, the event which separated Israel from Egypt. And all through the rest of the Bible, this separation of Israel from Egypt is one of the major tonalities of the Bible. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the, the theme which comes back again and again and again. And <clears throat> it is a matter of the highest importance for our understanding of our own cultural traditions that the tradition we have derived through Judaism and Christianity from the Bible has this revolutionary factor in it which uh, the Exodus story gives to it. And all the characteristics of the revolutionary mind are adumbrated right there and you find most of them repeated in Marxism today. One of those characteristics is the belief in a specific historical event as the starting point. That is, the story of Israel begins with Moses and the Exodus, and the story of Christianity begins with the birth of Christ. It doesn't begin with the Essenes or anything else that might have looked vaguely similar. <clears throat> the story of communism begins with Marx and Engels and not with <clears throat> Fourier or, or uh, Owen or Saint-Simon or any of the others that looked uh, similar. And Islam begins with Muhammad and the flight from Mecca to Medina. And that historical consciousness is, again, something that I may have stressed already, that uh, it gives to us that typological way of reading the Bible, which I have been concentrating on in this course, and as I tried to explain, typology is not a form of allegorical interpretation. It is a theory of history, or more accurately, of the historical process, which says that in spite of all the chaos and confusion in human events, nevertheless, those events are going somewhere and meaning something, and eventually something will happen which will indicate what their meaning is. That is what is distinctive about the biblical tradition, and it is what they have contributed, that tradition has contributed, to modern uh, theories of history, both progressive and revolutionary. <clears throat> and it's something which, so far as I know, is, uh, uh, is confined to that tradition. I don't find it in the Orient or in, in, uh, in the classics. Then another characteristic of the revolutionary mind is a dialectical habit of mind in which everything that is not for us is against us and all the middle ground is progressively eliminated. <clears throat> and as I may have said, the uh, Hebrews made their great contribution to, to uh, 
our own cultural traditions, as is the want of human nature, through their least amiable characteristic. And that was not their belief that their God was true. It was their belief that all other gods were false. And that conception of false god, uh, again, is, is, is something that would, would have been almost unintelligible to, say, an educated Greek or Roman. A Greek merchant traveling in Babylon would naturally commend himself to the gods of Babylon before going down to sleep, before going to sleep in Babylon. And uh, you can see various traces in the Old Testament of an original belief ascribed to other people, such as Assyrians, that there is nothing non-existent about other people's gods. I think I may have called your attention to a passage in the book of Kings in which the Syrians say among themselves when they're going to war with Israel that Israel's a hilly country, consequently Jehovah must be a good, must be a God very good at hill fighting. And if we can only get the Israelite army out of the hills and onto the plain, then we'll clean up on them. And of course this resulted in disaster for them because Jehovah, thin-skinned as ever, took, a, took offense at the notion that he wasn't equally good in valleys. And uh, <clears throat> similarly, if you look at the Trojan War, you'll see that when the Trojans are defeated, the Trojan gods are defeated with them. And the Trojan gods have to be taken by Aeneas to Italy to uh, uh, get refurbished and have an, another, uh, another period of power. And uh, all that is extremely remote from things like the contest between Elijah and the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel, where the uh, object is to prove not that Jehovah is stronger than Baal, but that Baal does not exist at all, it is not really a god, uh, but a figment of the human imagination. And that dialectical separation between the God and no God is something which seems to have come in with the teachings of the prophets and uh, again is, is almost unintelligible to a polytheistic mind. I think I mentioned earlier that in a tribal organization of society, the gods are local epiphanic gods, like the nymphs and the satyrs and the fauns of a later mythology. They are immediate deities of trees and stones and mountains. That when tribes are organized into nations, the gods become an aristocracy, and they usually sit on tops of mountains. And when the nations uh, grow into world empires where the ruler thinks of himself as the ruler of the world, then you do get a kind of monotheism in which all the effective gods retreat into the stars, but there is usually one supreme god. And all through history you find this type of monotheism associated with world rulers with an early pharaoh of Egypt who practic practically wrecked his empire in quest of his, of his one god, Ikhnaton his name was, and the early rulers of Persia, Cyrus and Darius, who were very fervent and devout, devout monotheists. But that kind of imperial monotheism is totally different from the revolutionary monotheism of the Bible. Um, Imperial monotheism is a very eclectic religion, that is, it tends to identify local cults with the service of the supreme god and say, oh well, they're all the this, this same god anyway. And uh, a liberal-minded person uh, in, the, in the late Roman Empire, for example, might even go to the point of collecting gods. And he would have no objection whatever 
to having statues of Jehovah and of Jesus in his collection. Uh, <clears throat> that is, he would think of any number of gods as equally uh, ways of, um, of reaching the truth of one God. And that is, again, an attitude of mind which is totally opposed to the kind of monotheism one finds in the Bible where God has a specific name and a specific role in history and uh, is, is, uh, is not simply a, a God in whom every other conception of deity may be absorbed. All right. <clears throat> Another feature of the <clears throat> same revolutionary mentality, I think, is the tendency to, to do precisely what the Israelites did, that is to build up a sacred book and to mark it off clearly from other books that are apocryphal or secular or, in some other respect, peripheral. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the conception of a sacred canon is <clears throat> something that seems to have grown up uniquely with the Israelite tradition. And <clears throat> it's possible that there is a scene in the Bible that, that uh, catches the moment of its birth. I, I don't know whether I pointed this out to you already or not, but uh, it's, in, uh, it's, it's in the second book of Kings. And it's the 22nd chapter. <clears throat> Here we have one of the uh, last kings of Judah and one of the few kings that the narrator approves of. And one of the first things he does is to repair the temple. And in the course of repairing the temple, a document is found, the Book of the Law. And in verse 8, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the Book of the Law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. <clears throat> so then they report this fact to the king. Uh, verse 11, And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And then he said, verse 13, Inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. <clears throat> for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. Now what is of a special importance in this passage is the king's conviction that it was a matter of the highest importance for the people as a whole to know the contents of a written document. We're a long way from democracy, but democracy is founded on the basis of public access to documents. So you can see history turning a rather decisive corner at this point. And such a book would have to be, in the first place, a law book, because it is the laws which are almost invariably regarded as sacred, as of divine origin, and as something that it concerns everyone to know. <clears throat> 
Now, it's been a practically the, the only thesis in biblical scholarship that the majority of biblical scholars are agreed on that this book of the law, which was then discovered, either was or was very closely related to the existing book of Deuteronomy. And that means, therefore, that the, if, if that is true, the book of Deuteronomy was the germ, the core, out of which the entire canon developed. It, it was probably later than that that the priests began to conflate the older accounts which they already had in temple records and which survive in such things as the earlier account of creation and uh, the, the Genesis stories. And the authors of Samuel and Kings are known as the Deuteronomic historians because they they follow the general dialectic of, of Deuteronomy in, uh, <clears throat> in their historical attitudes. And uh, the book of Deuteronomy itself seems to have been influenced by the writings and teachings of prophets who came bef before it, or at least before the time of its discovery. And uh, it it, that seems to leave us with the conclusion that <clears throat> such people as David and Solomon had never heard of Moses, that, they, that they, the notion of the contract at Mount Sinai which gave the Israelites the law is a post-Deuteronomic idea and grew up sometime after this discovery of the book by Josiah in the 7th century B.C. The notion of a canon of books that, that seem to belong together as especially sacrosanct uh, seems to be taking shape. We, we don't know very much about the way it operated, but that it was there seems, uh, seems inescapable. And, uh, And there's a curious symbolic contrast between the fact that the successful and prosperous empires of Egypt and Babylon and Assyria and the others produced the great temples, whereas the uh, Israelites, who, as I say, were never lucky at the game of empire, produced, produced the book. And to the people who wanted the kind of success that Assyria and Persia and Babylon had, the production of a book must have seemed a good deal like a booby prize. But uh, if you think of the relative durability of a book and a monument, you'll see that the facts are very different. There's a wonderful scene in the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah's secretary is reading to practically the last king of Judah a prophecy of Jeremiah consisting very largely of denunciations of the king's very foolish and obstinate policy of resistance to Babylon. And we're told that it was a cold day and there was a fire burning in the room of the palace. And Every so often, the infuriated king would cut a piece off the scroll with his knife and throw it in the fire. Well, that means that it was a papyrus scroll, because if it had been parchment, it would not only have bankrupted the prophet, but uh, it would also have been tough enough to spoil the king's gesture. So you have the contrast between the prophecy of Jeremiah, 
entrusted to the most fragile and combustible material that the ancient world produced. And the king's palace, built presumably out of the stones of Solomon's, Solomon's palace, which had taken him 13 years to build. And after 2,500 years, not the slightest trace remains of the king's palace, whereas the book of Jeremiah remains in reasonably good shape. <clears throat> so the contrast between producing a book which can be wiped out by the merest breath of accident and the great stone monuments that are there to endure forever and actually crumble in a few years. Well, that, that seems to be a mystery. Nobody, no, no scholar has a suggestion as to its, its ultimate origin or how old it was when it was discovered in the temple. But by certain sociological indications in the book of Deuteronomy itself, most scholars date it about, say, 40 or 50 years before the time of its discovery, uh, which would mean that it was somewhere around the earlier part of the 7th century BC. Well, they wouldn't have known about the Mosaic Code, never, uh, necessarily. That is, the, the notion of, of the Israelites going into the desert and they're receiving the Code of Laws, which was the Mosaic Code, uh, may be a later construct than the, uh, than the time of, of David and Solomon. I, I merely say that that is a, is a very common scholarly assumption. I, I, uh, I'm not... I'm not an expert in this field, but, but that's the, what is called the Wellhausen hypothesis, and, and uh, because it's German in the 19th century, it ought to be treated with respect. <coughs> and then Finally, the, in, the, in this list of revolutionary characteristics I'm giving, one is the tendency to regard the, your near neighbor who is separated from you only by a very slight heresy as a much deadlier and more detestable enemy than the agreed common enemy. That is, the... Uh, <clears throat> Early Christianity, for example, didn't so much attack the pagans, they attacked the Gnostics or the Arians and called them pagans. And uh, just as in a Marxist struggle for power today, uh, the people attacked are not capitalist reactionaries, they are Trotskyists or supporters of the Gang of Four who are called agents of uh, the bourgeois counter-revolution. And uh, with Judaism, similarly, there is a much greater bitterness against the northern kingdom for its secession, and later on with the Samaritans who occupied the same place, than there is <clears throat> against, for example, the Persians. The word canon is an interesting one. It, uh, it's in the prophecy of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is told to take a, a reed and measure the temple of God, and the word for reed is kana, and it's from that word, ultimately, through Greek intermediaries, that we get our word canon. And, uh, so that symbolically, at least, metaphorically, there seems to be some connection between this, this symbol of measuring the temple 
and constructing a verbal canon. And uh, if you look at the eleventh chapter of Revelation, the one that I've pointed out before, uh, you will see that that begins with the angel giving the narrator a reed like a rod and telling him to measure the temple of God. And immediately following is the account of the martyrdom of the two witnesses who, as we saw, are connected with Moses and Elijah, the two pillars of Scripture, the symbolic law and prophets. <clears throat> Any question that far then? Well, we'll continue with that next next day then.